Welcome back. Um, last time we looked at the very first verse of, of the book of James. We saw the, the greeting. Uh, we saw how James called his brother the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we saw that the, the point of this book, or I should say the, the recipients of this book, are the, 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 the large Jewish diaspora, perhaps more specifically around Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, or perhaps the wider Jewish diaspora. In any case, the, the book itself is um, very important for the wider Jewish diaspora, but it's also important to us today, uh, mainly because it includes so many statements about um, that, that, that are applicable in terms of, of wisdom and applying how uh, faith must be accompanied by works and, and how we are to treat one another uh, in, in the body of the church and in light of calling upon our, uh, on the calling upon our lives. Well, with that, let me go ahead and share my screen so you can see where we're going, um, where we're going today with this. Let's share. That being bigger. <clears throat> well, here's our outline. We looked at this uh, last time. We got so far as the the greeting. Uh, in this session, we'll look at the purpose of trials. Uh, what is the purpose of trials in the the Christian life? How does that function? Here's that first line. I'll go ahead and read it for introduction. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are in the dispersion, greetings. Then he jumps into this. Count it all joy, my brothers, and that word brothers, um, Adelphoi, can be brothers and sisters. It just means the, the church, um, those who are part of the, the faith community that he's identified with. When you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness, some translations translate this patience, have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Well, these are the opening lines to the letter of the book of James, the letter that starts off this, this long discussion of uh, really wise sayings around um, the idea of, of, of being perfect. Um, and so let's first talk about uh, what something really, that really stands out in, in these open lines is this idea of perfection. What does James mean? Is he saying that Christians, because they believed in Jesus, are now called to be perfect? Is he crazy? Does he know these people? He's a pastor of a church in Jerusalem. Certainly he knows people aren't perfect and they can't be perfect. Um, or does he? Does he know that? Uh, well, this is, this is part of the question. What does it mean to be perfect? Well, this has been, a, would say, a question that has um, been a, really at the forefront of, of many different theologies throughout the history of the church. We can point back to different times in even the American church, for instance, in the Second Great Awakening, or this idea of perfection, that you could attain a certain level of holiness where you don't sin. Well, many um, pastors today, and, and really anyone that interacts with them, themselves or others, understand that we all sin. And there's actually going to be places in James, so there's going to be places, of course, in other parts of the New Testament, such as Romans, which says all have fallen short, we all sin. Uh, and so it seems pretty straightforward that, Paul, that, that James cannot and does not mean that those who are followers of Jesus will not sin. And that's really, of course, not what he means. Instead, if we look at um, what the word actually means, comes from teleos, um, it to means, which can mean to be perfect or can be to be full or to be complete. We might translate this, maybe not translate, but to understand it as full maturity, and especially with that idea of being perfect and complete together, that you may be 
perfect and complete together. That is to be mature, that you, that you don't have any weaknesses in your faith, that yes, you may sin, and yes, you may have to ask the Lord for forgiveness over the course of your life. You're marked by a, um, a life that is um, working towards these common, a common goal, uh, towards full maturity, towards a, a single-mindedness in your devotion and affection and love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and, and that is really, I think, what is the driving force behind the book of James. And uh, if, we, if we look at this, even in this opening chapter, we see this word perfect used three times. Here it's that you may be perfect and complete. Uh, a little bit later, he will talk about, in a very important section in 117, how every good gift and every perfect gift, we get that word again, is from above, from the Father of, um, from, from the, the Father of lights. Um, he gives this, this is that wisdom from above that we talked about, the, the gift that allows you to have this level of maturity and fullness in your life. Um, and then to, to really highlight that even more, and I would say um, something that's super critical to understanding the book of James, it says towards the end of this chapter, the one who looks in the perfect law of liberty, and we'll talk about the law of liberty later there, that's a reference that connects us with Jesus's statements, in particular in Matthew 5. Um, and I have it here in the, on the slides. You can see Jesus says at the end of Matthew 5, which is uh, kind of a culmination of a, of a section there that begins with the Beatitudes and ends at the end of that chapter with the following statement. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now that is a really interesting line, it conveys the same idea, because Jesus over the course of Matthew 5, that whole section, has developed this new idea of, of how um, people, how, how Jews, those followers of him, are supposed to interact with the law, and how it's not actually the letter of the law in all of uh, or especially the traditions surrounding the law, but it's the heart of the law. Um, so if, you, if you're angry with your brother, that's just like murder. If you look upon a woman and you lust after her, that's committing adultery and, and, and so on. And this is, this is a deeper law. This is a law of perfection. This is a law that is marked by your spirit. How do you feel on the inside? How is your conscience being driven? And so we see then already the outset of, of, of James' teaching, that there's this deep connection that's going to be throughout the book where he is going to line up with Jesus' teaching. Now, that's not to say that other uh, books in the New Testament don't line up with Jesus' teaching. Of course they do. But what we're saying is, is that his book is, is really almost like an exposition on many of Jesus's teachings. It's applying Jesus's teachings to his own life and to the lives of others and giving them uh, not new, he's giving not necessarily new insight, but different insight and how it can be applied in different ways. Now, if we go back to the beginning of this verse, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Now, there's going to be the idea in, in this verse and, and in other verses, this idea of persecution. And perhaps the persecution, as we've said, is related to the stoning of Stephen and the persecution that begins to spread throughout the community. And so one obvious trial um, is, of course, going to be persecution from the Jewish establishment. That's going to be something that, that exists throughout. That's really in the background. Um, it's not something that, that James really um, talks about. It, it doesn't identify that in, in, in the book. But another thing I want us to see here is how he uh, has almost a stair-stepping uh, idea here. He says, you have this trial, and this trial is going to test your faith. The testing of that faith is going to take you to steadfastness. And when steadfastness is there, it's going to make you perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And so it's this 
build up. And we might even say that this uh, has the idea of uh, a race, running a race. Now you might say, where is that? Well, in, in a couple verses down the line, once we get to the end here, and, and, and James is going to tell us that, that they have the crown of life for those who um, love God, that God's going to give them this, this crown of life. Uh, he's already starting us on this idea that you have endurance, you have steadfastness, again, patience in this, in this race, and it's going to take you all the way to the end. And so that image may not be there just yet, but it's going to blossom towards the end of this opening paragraph, which ends in, uh, ends in chapter 12. Now, again, I just want to focus on uh, these statements, and I just want to give us some, some uh, we're going to look at a number of these images that, that appear in the Sermon on the Mount. I love this aerial, um, which, comes from, uh, which comes from BiblePlaces.com. Uh, All the images that you see are from, from uh, BiblePlaces.com, or most of them are from BiblePlaces.com. Uh, and here you have that line again, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Jesus, when he's making that statement, uh, is calling again for this, for this new law, this new law that he as this new Moses, this new lawgiver, uh, is giving to them. But he's actually quoting uh, in some way, not quoting, but you might say playing around with Leviticus. Because Leviticus 11 tells us that uh, you must be holy for God is holy. Well, this idea of perfection has this idea of holiness, but it's not holiness only in the form of ritual. It's an inward holiness. It's an inward perfection that is driven by the Spirit. And we'll see later how this also connects with Jeremiah 31 and the idea of the new covenant, how they have the Spirit living inside of them, um, but they don't need to be taught the law because it's there on the inside. Uh, and you also have this in uh, the rich young ruler. Jesus is going to tell the rich young ruler, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Which of course, he is unwilling to do. So this idea of perfection, again, is, is really at the heart of much of what James is going to say. Well, let's move to the next verses in this opening section. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Well, as we take a look at this, this section, there's a number of different ways that we could uh, approach this. Uh, first of all, as, as, as I've said, wisdom literature, Proverbs, uh, Job, Ecclesiastes, um, is, is a big part of, of the, the Old Testament. Uh, it's actually bigger than that than we think, not only because we have those books, but we have this whole body of wisdom literature that develops in what we call the intertestamental period. So we have other books, the book of, of of, of Sirach, we have the uh, Wisdom of Solomon, and, and many of these other books that are that are really chock full of very important, very wise teachings. Uh, the one I'd just like to focus in on is, is is not necessarily a wise teaching, but this idea of a request, because to me this immediately draws to, brings to my mind the famous request of of Solomon. Uh, this is Solomon uh, who is just been put on the throne of David, and uh, a couple, he's, he's gone through uh, really a bloody set of circumstances where he's having to make sure that his crown is secure. And as he starts off, he goes to the pre where the presence of the Lord is um, at Gibeon, where there is a high place where there's an altar, the altar of Moses. Um, and instead of asking for all these things, he could have asked because the Lord lets him, says, yeah, ask me anything. Um, this is what Solomon asks. He says, give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And so it's pleasing to the Lord that we ask for wisdom. I think that's important for us to hear and see. We should ask for wisdom. We should consistently and regularly ask the Lord 
to give us wisdom and to give us understanding. Uh, we shouldn't doubt what James says here. Ask the Lord to give you wisdom. He will give it to you. He will give you the desire um, to, 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 to know him better, to, to live your life better, to live your life according to his principles, which, as we've said, is part of this idea of perfection or maturity, uh, to have wisdom. Now, you might ask, what is wisdom? <laughs> what is wisdom or chokmah in, in, in Hebrew uh, or Sophia in Greek? What is this idea of wisdom? Uh, well, there's lots of different interpretations. One of the ones that I think is easiest to remember is skill in living. How do you live? Uh, you need to be skilled at it. Well, being skilled in living in the body of Christ as a follower of King Jesus means following his, his commands. And he will give us the wisdom and the ability. And thankfully, we already as believers have the spirit living inside of us so that we know how to follow him. And he gives us that conscience and that spirit change to do so. Um, and so with that, with, and here you have, again, Solomon asking that and, and a picture of uh, where it was that he actually asked this at Gibeon. But as he says this, and again, it says, let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like the wave of a sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Here we have, very nice picture of waves at the Sea of Galilee. Of course, these stand out to us in the, uh, in the Gospels. There's a couple episodes in the Gospels where waves are quite dangerous for the apostles. Uh, I've included one of them here mostly because of the close similarity that we have in Jesus' statement to Peter to what James just said. Now, when he, Peter, saw the wind, he gets out on the boat, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. And so uh, even maybe, I don't know if we could say this for sure, but it's kind of interesting that James uses this language. He says, have faith, don't doubt, and if you do doubt, it's like you're in the sea and it's, way, it's going around. Um, does he have in mind this very event that happens with, uh, with Peter and Jesus? Maybe, uh, but even if not, ha the, the idea of a wave moving around to and fro uh, shows, uh, shows this wavering that that he has. Now, another teaching of Jesus that, that, is, that is important and, and, and certainly would have been known to James uh, is Jesus' teaching um, during Passion Week. Now, during Passion Week, Jesus and the disciples are going back and forth to, to Bethany, a place that is two miles um, uh, east of Jerusalem. And over the course of this time, um, they, they're passing through every day and night the Garden of Gethsemane, and which is at the base of, of the Mount of Olives. Uh, and so one of these days, as they're passing through earlier in the week, uh, Jesus passes a fig tree, and he says the following. Jesus answered them, uh, I should say, uh, the fig tree didn't have fruit. And Jesus was hungry, and so he curses the fig tree. And it says, Jesus answered them, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, again, sea language, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Now, this is not a blank check to ask God for material wealth or material possessions or anything like that. These, all of these, um, these statements about faith and, and not doubting, they are connected with the idea that you have wisdom to face a trial, that you have wisdom and strength and ability to endure temptation, to endure a, a, a particular persecution or trial. And so that context is really important to understand when we talk about both what Jesus says and what James argues here, and here's a nice fig tree, actually, right where Jesus cursed one on Mount of Olives. Well, uh, in this last sentence of 
uh, man, uh, uh, of James 1, um, this section 5 through 8, he says the following, for that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. So the one who doubts, even though he may ask, but he doubts, he's not going to receive anything from the Lord. Why? Well, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now, the lack of stability connects us with, um, connects us with this, this image of being tossed to and fro on the, the waves. But what does it mean to be a double-minded man? Um, and and this, this actually comes down to it. So it's, it's not necessarily a mystery to us, but there's a question as to, what does James mean? So when we think double-minded, uh, this means that we have two ideas in our head. They're, they're warring with one another. We don't know which way to go. And we may say one thing, but we really mean another. This could be duplicitous. Um, but but is, is that really what James is saying? Well, in some ways, yes. But the word he, he refers to actually almost can be understood as like double-souled. That is, it means two souls, literally, in Greek. And he's the only one who actually uses this uh uses this 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 phrase and uses it twice in his in his book uh and it probably connects us um better with some of the wisdom literature and in the psalms like this one psalm 12 2 everyone who utters lies to his neighbor with flattering lips and a double heart they speak it means really to have divided loyalties that you are pulled in different directions um, how, where does your loyalty lie? Does it lie here on earth with wisdom from below or with the wisdom from above, from the God who is wanting to give you wisdom, who is generously giving to you without reproach, or are you taking other factors into consideration, uh, other parts that are dividing your soul? Uh, and of course, um, we could put many examples. I've, I put one up here because we're in Texas, a house divided uh, between UT and Texas A&M, which is our, which way is our soul being pulled? And I know in our particular setting, uh, it goes towards maroon. Uh, but that's, that's the key is where are your loyalties? Where are your faith loyalties? Are they in wealth or, or are they in the wisdom of God? And that's a, a really key point for the book of James. And, and I would say it's, it's a key point for, for all of life. We often, and I often um, am very encouraged by when we think of God, when we think within, of, of our following Christ as, um, a, a, as people who are followers of, of King Jesus. Uh, but what we, we, we really need to do is, is to consistently think about why we're doing what we're doing. Is it because we are um, wanting to follow the Lord, or is it because we're wanting to follow something that we want, or something that is driving us towards wealth, towards entertainment, towards earthly wisdom? And, and, and that's, again, a, a major part of this book. Well, as we continue through here, he moves to uh, something that really highlights the fact that what he was talking about is wealth. What he was talking about when he talks about this divided loyalty is wealth and prestige, something that is very prominent in the, um, in the gospel teachings of the Lord. Many teachings about wealth and how difficult it is for the wealthy to believe that all things are possible with the Lord. And so he addresses here, it's important to see, he addresses both um, the, the lowly and the, and the rich. Now, these are not, um, at least in this passage, uh, unbelievers. It seems that in this passage, both the poor and the wealthy are referring to Christians. That, and so he's addressing a particular aspect of what Christian life is in these early Jewish Christian communities. Uh, between the wealthy and the poor. Now, he's going to talk more about this, uh, this topic later on in chapter 2 and in uh, chapter 5. So this is a, a key issue for him, the relationship uh, in, in terms of social status, in terms of wealth in the church. So I'll go ahead and read it. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich brother 
in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flowers fall and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Well, as we, as we look about this, we see this two ways or these, this image where they're, they're turned on their head. The wealthy are exalted now. The lowly are not exalted. They're humiliated. And yet, uh, James sees this as reversed. Now, he sees this reversed not in the sense of a eschatological view. In other words, he's not saying, in the end, this is the way it will be. I would take this to mean here and now, in the present. And so if that's the case, what would that mean? That would mean that the lowly brother boasts in his exaltation of what? Of being in Christ, of being in the covenant community of those who are following the exalted risen Lord. And so that can both be the case for the lowly who now have the exaltation of Christ, but also the rich, because their Lord, who is exalted, yes, also endured horrific humiliation. Um, such as we see here, with a crown of thorns placed upon his brow, beaten in to be the so-called king of the Jews, to undergo this horrible humiliation. They identify with that too. And in these next uh, few verses, uh, 10, 11, he's, he's giving these images of how uh, wealth is fleeting, flower uh, fading away. Now, just so we have... Um, some, some context to this, and so we can add um, some, some real background to this, because certainly all this applies. We're, we're familiar with wealth and social status and these types of things in our own day, uh, and of course, we've heard about Jesus talk about it in the, in the, in the Gospels, and here we have it with James, but we actually have some very nice uh, archaeological remains that illustrate this. Um, this is one of my favorite sites in, in all of uh, the country, in all of Israel, to, to visit. I've been visiting this for the last, I don't know, eight, nine years since they first uh, uncovered this. And just a little context here, you can see that this is really a work site. And this is a, uh, a hotel. This is Magdala, uh, a home of, of, of Mary Magdalene. And so a, a number of years ago, uh, the Catholic Church purchased this territory. It used to be called Magdala, Hawaii. Uh, they don't call it that anymore. Um, and they, they, they decided to build a huge hotel here. Um, and as literally they were, they were laying the cornerstone or, or preparing to lay the cornerstone of the hotel, uh, they struck pay dirt. Um, underneath this tent, uh, which is now built there to preserve what they found, they found a synagogue. And it's a first century beautiful synagogue um, that undoubtedly Jesus would have, have taught in administered to Mary Magdalene would have uh, would have been to uh, just a, just a fantastic synagogue with that they found a, was probably a a Torah uh, altar that the, the alt, that the Torah was laid on uh, and we, we don't want to talk about that too much here we'll, we'll show some images of that later on uh, but what's cool about this find is not just the synagogue but the entire village that's been exposed or parts of it that have been exposed. We have next to the synagogue, which would be a shared religious space, a large commercial area, with fish ponds perhaps, um, and then other aspects of, of commerce. You have a street running through it. And just as you cross over to the modern street, you come over into just some absolutely fantastic homes that would have been the wealthy landowners, the, the wealthy living in Magdala from the time of Christ. They have their own ritual baths. They have water flowing right to them, uh, right off the nearby uh, mountain. And then next to them, you have these poorer homes, uh, homes that are less well-built, less well-constructed, that the finds that were found in them uh, in terms of pottery and, and other items were, were far less, uh, far less fancy. And so just to to, to lay this out, these are not in the diaspora, they're, they're in the land, but we're seeing a, what presumably is a typical Jewish village with poorer homes, wealthier homes, commercial district, and synagogue. And we can imagine 
how these social standings would have, uh, have taken place, how there's this preference for the rich, uh, even in these Jewish communities, something that's so prevalent in uh, Jewish society to favor the rich. Now, in the Jewish setting, the rich, or the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, people that have this, this income that is supported by the people of the land, Jesus talks about it uh, quite often. We can talk about most famously those who devour widows' households, become wealthy off the back of the, the poor and those who should be cared for. And so, but that is carried over um, into the, the, the early church. And, and James does not like it. He's addressing this issue head on. Well, he also talks about, um, and he uses several images, and this is one of the things I, I really want to convey, that James is a master um, at conveying different theological points, different wise sayings with imagery. Uh, and here he uses a very common one, and that is the fact that, uh, that, that worldly wealth, wealth in the here and now, is fleeting. It's like a flower. It's like grass that fades away. Uh, of course, uh, Proverbs says, whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf, comparing those, uh, those ideas. Um, and I, I'm always reminded, it always sticks in my mind, George Strait's famous line, you don't bring nothing with you here and you can't take nothing back. I ain't never seen a hearse with a luggage rack. Uh, maybe not as eloquent as Solomon or James, but, but very true, uh, that the wealth of the here and now is fleeting. It's, it, it doesn't go with you. We can think of Jesus' statements also in Sermon on the Mount um, that, 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 address this, that address this issue. Um, and here we see, just to, to talk about the scorching heat and withering the grass, uh, we have an image comparing what it looks like in the spring. Uh, it's green, it's beautiful, the grass, because there's lots of rain. Well, fast forward a few months here in the fall in October, and it's all dead. Waiting that newness to return with the early rains and the latter rains to give it this greenness once again. Well, that's what James is saying. That's what wealth is like. Um, and so don't trust in it. Trust in the wisdom of God. Trust in the promises of God whether you're wealthy, whether you're poor, trust in what, what God has given you in terms of following him, in terms of, these, uh, in terms of wisdom. Well, he ends this section uh, with, uh, with the following verse. Blessed is the man, who, and it automatically you should have bells ringing, blessed is the man, if you're like me and you uh, grew up memorizing scripture, that is one of the first ones you memorized, Psalm 1 who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. This is a beautiful verse. Um, this is a beautiful verse for, for a number of reasons. Uh, and this is one of the things I get really excited about when we study scripture, because scripture isn't just a, a static stay in place text. It takes us places. It takes us places in the past. Uh, particularly here, we have uh, James taking us back to a, few, a few, to a few verses back to what he just said at the beginning of this section, to verses two through four. But he's also taking us back all the way to Psalm 1, blessed is the man. But he's especially taking us back to statements that Jesus makes on the Sermon on the Mount, the be attitude, blessed is the or are these who have these character traits. Let me just tie in here, though, what he says here in uh, the beginning of this section and what we read here. He talks about in 2 and 4, when you meet trials, the testing of your faith, producing steadfastness, and steadfastness having its full effect. Well, he brings those same ideas out here. Blessed is the man who re remains steadfast under trial, who undergoes these difficult circumstances for the wealthy, to the poor. When he withstood the test, he will receive the crown of life. What does that mean, crown of life? We'll talk about it in a minute, which God has promised to those who love him. And so those who with, withstand these trials, who withstand these tests, uh, are those who love God. 
which in another way, if we're saying it like we say at the beginning, are those who are complete and perfect. And so that's synonymous there. Well, we can see this connection if we look at, if we look at what, uh, what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. We read there at the end as it, as it reads, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It says in the, the latter part of, of Matthew uh, 5 in the, in the section of the Beatitudes, blessed are those who persecute, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So here we have James again, making a very similar statement to what Jesus says on the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed is the man who withstands trial. Well, we've already said that perhaps this book is written for those who are undergoing persecution in the diaspora. Well, perhaps James is reminded of this statement that Jesus makes in the Sermon on the Mount. Those who are persecuted receiving the kingdom of heaven. Now, in James's language, this kingdom of heaven doesn't use the term kingdom of heaven, but he uses the term crown of life. What is a crown of life? Well, if we, if we read it here, we, we, we can imagine that it's eternal life. And, and that's certainly true, but what does the image really convey? Well, Paul tells us about and uses the same image. He says, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to, re to receive a perishable wreath. Um, and, and you can see on this, on this dude here, uh, this very nice bronze statue, he has a wreath, a, a, a crown on his head. Paul says this is, um, that's perishable, but we receive an imperishable uh, reward, an, an imperishable one. John also uses this in the book of Revelation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, in terms of James, James 1, 12, if we think back to the beginning of this section, how he has said, let, you know, persevere under trial, that'll give you steadfastness. You can endure till the end, and, and it will have its full effect, and it will make you perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And then the end of that is that God will give you this crown of life, which he's promising to those who love. It's the reward at the end of this struggle, at the end of this trial. So it's an imagining a, a, a runner going through the process uh, uh, that, that's testing you step by step along the way with the knowledge that at the end of this, you are receiving this crown of life that God has promised you. Uh, and so it's just a really very fitting image uh, to what James is trying to, to, to get at. Well, here's the message of this, this opening section. Trials produce steadfastness. We should rejoice over trials. Steadfastness is what makes us perfect and complete remaining true. To have this perfection is not the idea that we don't sin anymore continue to sin, but we are spiritually mature, we're complete, we're equipped. Uh, and therefore, we should rejoice in these trials because these test us, and these actually make us better runners in this, uh, in this metaphor. If we do lack wisdom, well, easy answer, ask God for wisdom. But when we ask, don't doubt. We said that means lacking loyalty. It's trusting in worldly wisdom to use King James um, version, mammon, wealth, um, instead of trusting completely in the Lord. Uh, we need to, to, to trust uh, the Lord and to not trust wealth. If we lack wealth, boast in our exaltation in Christ. If we have wealth, boast in our humiliation. So whether wealthy or poor or anywhere in between, we have an identity that is shared in Christ, who, even though he, to use Colossians language, was exalted, came to the lowly, who came to earth and humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. And that humiliation should remind the wealthy that their Lord became low. And the, the poor should be reminded that they identify with the highest possible uh, highest possible being, um, and, and they have that relationship with him. And, and that humility that both have 
should, should create better relationships and greater realities between, between those, those two groups. And then finally, the completion of steadfastness under trial equals blessing and the crown of life, which is promised from God for those who love him. And here we have a perishable wreath, a golden crown with, with leaves. And so as, as we end this, uh, as we end this session, we can see that James is taking us in a direction where he is wanting to get down into the nitty gritty daily life of poor and, and, and wealthy, of actually running the race rightly and having uh, this, this completeness in, in, in the Christian life that is going to lead us to, to godliness and steadfastness. Um, and, and at the end of all this, if we, if we follow and we're loyal to the Lord, we have this crown of life waiting for us that God has promised to those who love him. And so in the next sections, he's going to take us uh, down similar directions, uh, but, but he's really going to be building off of these, uh, these ideas of how wisdom um, is, is, again, from above and not from below. And so we'll look at that in the next session.